rose petals seem to fall. It's all like a dream to call you Inequality that appeared in 2004. 
In the approach, we detail every step of the process. Our paper explores the role of information provided by friends, relatives, neighbors, or acquaintances during job search and its consequences for the job market and economic inequality. In doing so, it also ventured into some sociology literature. I learned immensely working with her. Linda was careful, meticulous, and a voice of reason and caution in our collaboration. She protected our work from numerous unproven conjectures. A profound care for what the facts are, and for what and for what scientific conclusions and what scientific conclusions they might support, were instances of her palpable intellectual integrity. I recall her voice telling me things like, that's not there, it's not in the data, Yanni. Yes, it would be nice if you were there, but it's not. <laughs> Linda joined Taft in 1984. She had earned her PhD in economics in 1978 for MIT and her MBA in economics in 1973 for Swarthmore College. Before Taft, she spent four years at the University of Michigan and then held a postdoctoral fellowship at Harvard's Du Bois Institute and the Kennedy School of Government from 1982 to 1984. Linda's MIT dissertation was titled The Effects of Higher Women's Labor Force Participation Rates on the Relative Earnings of Black and White Families. And it was supervised by Jay Hartman, who couldn't be here today, uh, Lester Thoreau, and Michael Piori, who was actually here with us today. In her acknowledgement, she wrote, the work also benefited from the comments of past and current members of the Black Graduate Economics Association of MIT. In particular, Glenn Lowry has provided moral and intellectual support throughout my stay in MIT. Linda's connection to the Tufts Economics Department began in November 1983 when she applied for, for, for an assistant professor position. David Garman, our colleague, uh, recalls noticing her application. He also recalls, he told me, that the smart and poised young economist he remembered from Michigan also brought with her to Tufts her unsparing honesty, fierce determination, <coughs> and personal loyalty. In 1983, the department was evolving from being teaching oriented with few research expectations to teaching oriented with serious research ex expectations. Linda was, David says, a stalwart among the group of assistant professors leading this transition. She provided a shining example of how to balance teaching and research obligations and how to maintain focus on the important. Linda was not only the first female African American to receive an economics degree from MIT, as we heard from Sandy Tarity, she was also, we believe, the first female African American faculty member to be promoted to full professor by the Tufts School of Arts and Sciences. And she was very proud of that, she told me herself. She had postponed seeking promotion to full professor because her own standards were so high. Another colleague, Dean Metcalf, recalls, it brought clarity to the issues and a level of personal integrity and rigor that elevated any department discussion. She had an act for cutting to the heart of a contentious and complex issue and articulating the essentials of the issue. We're never worried that departmental, department moral or academic standards would become added when she was in the room. Similarly, as David Garner puts it, Linda was a master of reigning in the distracted. We all need to recall focusing us by asking, why are we talking about this? <laughs> Linda was not really shocked. As a colleague, she was also shocked. Several of us in this audience have rightly been told that we talk too much. <laughs> if it needed to be said, Linda would say it. The tie to a greatly divided about academic decisions for faculty appointments. Her views had a disproportionate way because of her patent integrity and the clear thinking. Without denigrating any candidate's academic credentials, more than once she guided us to look at issues of values. She was skillful in awakening us to ethical implications of faculty discussions without claiming a moral high ground. She helped us acknowledge that research can touch on emotional subjects. Linda got us to recognize how the way one would talk about such subjects could offend not only individual sensitivities but also social norms. Today, we can express out loud our esteem for the way Linda chose to handle their illness. 
After the cancer was diagnosed, she sent us all an email. She told us of her cancer and sent out her brown She did not want us to broach the subject with her. It was not easy for us, but we respected her views. To quote Anne Belichick, she managed cancer in her life with the elegance, grace, and dignity she brought to all things. <clears throat> when a friend or colleague became ill, however, Linda did show what she had learned. While she commanded respect, she was also a very straightforward person with an extraordinary endowment of uncommon common sense, to borrow this time from Dan Richard's words in Linda's funeral. Um, two more items. Linda had another life as a fierce tennis player, but I know nothing about that, maybe. <laughs> I, I wouldn't dare try to do it a terrible thing. So. I wish Linda could live to hear people speak so highly of her work and her reality as they have since she died. She was extraordinarily modest about her own scientific uh, contributions. But I do recall her hearty laugh at an important seminar when Stephen Durov, our visiting speaker, credited her scholarly contributions as the grandmother of the social interactions literature. Glad you were there. Um, speaking on behalf of all our colleagues, let me say that Linda brought uh, the intelligence and wisdom that I've tried to portray today in all the incremental and university activities to which she was asked to participate. As we just heard from Jonathan, as a long-time instructor of our quantitative intermediate microeconomics, she was truly the heart of our quantitative economics major. Uh, she taught courses on labor economics, economics of income distribution, Income Equality, Poverty, Economic Justice, these are separate courses. Women in the labor market, topics in non-competitive labor markets, economics of gender, race, and ethnic inequality, and blacks and labor markets. They gave our curriculum extraordinary depth. Committees that were fortunate to have her as a member delivered. Seminars in large focus were streamlined, and hiring meetings were made to focus on the right things. She was indeed an intellectual and moral pillar of our department for nearly 30 years, as Enrico Scolaura told the task today. And, and, and before I conclude, I'd just like to, to read what I heard from Greg Duncan and Mary Corcoran, her colleagues in University of Michigan. Uh, uh, Greg says, uh, Mary and I worked with Linda on the panel study of income dynamics many months ago. She was a graduate student and with newly minted PhDs. Linda was a terrific colleague, smart, very funny, and not one to take much breath from the powers that be. I will cherish those moments and those from our occasional counter sessions when we run across each other at meetings. That's a uh, great time. Finally, as David Garman says, Linda's passing leaves a deep hole in our department and in the hearts of her friends and colleagues at Tufts. Our only consolation is the memory of her time. I'm not too much better now. <laughs> really, really, really. 
And the thing about Linda for me that was really, really important, and it was for years, was that, and I don't know how to say this in the most elegant way, but I'll, I'll try. Uh, one of the toughest parts for me about uh, coming to Harvard was the language barrier. Uh, I used to have to take my emails, I'm talking about this, I used to have to take my emails from the dean of the school and said all this language that I didn't really understand. It was kind of passive aggressive and everything really together. And I would send it to someone to translate and get back to me so I could understand it better. But when I didn't need any translation. Um, we just kind of got each other from the first time that Lynn introduced us. And it's interesting for me to hear uh, how Linda touched all our lives. But for me, it was a different slant. Uh, Linda and I, uh, we shared good gospel, for example. You know, we would sit in the seminar and we would say, the paper was fine, what about those shoes he had? <laughs> <laughs> you can fix the paper, I'm not sure about the shoes. <laughs> so the spirit of uh, social economics, the field of Linda that I hope work in, I will tell you about my relationship with Linda and with Linda and with Linda and with Nehemiah. Uh, on three dimensions, human capital, social capital, and social interactions. We'll start with human capital. Uh, very quickly, after I met Glenn Linda, Glenn invited me to Boston. Uh, I didn't know how to get here. Uh, there was no GPS at that time. Uh, I wasn't smart enough to figure out there was Google Maps. I knew Google Maps in 1999. Uh, I was at uh, Penn State, I believe, so I decided to drive east until I met the water and then left. <laughs> <laughs> and we met in Boston, and quickly thereafter, they invited me to their uh, summer home, or weekend home, whatever it was, in New Hampshire. And uh, Glenn went up, I think a day early, uh, and it was me, Nehemiah, and Glenn II in the car, way up. And as you probably know, uh, Linda was a phenomenal parent. And I remember her talking uh, to Glenn and Nehemiah. I think, I was trying to think about it yesterday. I think they were barely in the double digits, maybe 10, 12, 14, something like that. And I was a seven year graduate student. And Linda talked about the beauty of the number nine. Because the number nine is a very beautiful number. If you multiply by two, you get 18, you add those up, you get nine. Multiply by three, you get 27, you add those up, you get nine, you multiply by nine. And you, you understand how this argument goes. Linda was explaining that and then tossed a little bit of how you could prove that this was true forever by induction. Um, I had never heard anything like that. In fact, sometimes I would admit I used to play asleep in the car when she would parent the boys because I was trying to learn. <laughs> and I remember we went to the house, we had dinner that night, everyone went to sleep, the boys were sleeping, I think, in the basement. Linda, Linda was on the top floor, I was on the first floor, and everybody went to sleep, man. I was in my little room talking. <laughs> we used to play Pictionary at the New Hampshire house, and um, this is when I realized I may be in, in over my head in terms of the profession, because it was me, it was Glenn, it was Glenn, it was Nehemiah, and at that time it was Clifford. And let's just say I ranked second in IQ to Clifford. Um, <laughs> And nobody wanted, I'm just call you all out, nobody wanted me on the Pictionary team. That's the truth. <laughs> nobody wanted me on the Pictionary team. In fact, it might have been clear that might start crying. Like, I don't want him on my team. <laughs> and Linda said, no, no, no. He understands the cultural stuff on the Pictionary questions. It made me feel good. I, mean, I, said, I don't want him on my team either. <laughs>